This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Um, historians generally portray the Great Exhibition of 1851 as a public spectacle that showcased the impressive progress of science, technology, and industry. And in adopting this perspective, they have endorsed the very pragmatic values of the exhibition's organisers, and they also reflect the prosaic ethos conveyed through such things as the catalogues. However, a very different perception of the exhibition emerges if we concentrate instead on the experience of visitors, and here are some of them coming in, who numbered probably in excess of two million in individuals. Many visitor accounts survive, particularly in diaries and letters, both published and unpublished, and in periodicals and other contemporary sources. Although they have attracted relatively little scholarly attention, such accounts show how individuals engage the exhibition and also convey the immense excitement that gripped London in the summer of 1851 perhaps comparable to the Olympic fever which some of us enjoyed last summer. Now, in this short paper, I'm going to reflect on the visitors' emotional responses to the exhibition, not all of whom are quite like these ones you see here, uh, both to the building and the objects displayed. At the outset, it should be noted that unlike some of the objects discussed in other papers in this conference, the exhibition was not really for intimate private consumption, but was a prominent public spectacle and one which captured the imagination of the masses. To give just one example among many, many in a letter to the novelist Margaret Gatty, the very chair botanist George Johnson commented, the glorious wonders of the exhibition has taken hold of my senses and of my whole brain and in my dreams I recall many other views from the entrance, from the gallery, <coughs> and from this corner and from that. While individuals manifested a range of different responses to the exhibition, there was also a degree of contagion, which was mediated by the frequent reports in newspapers and periodicals that helped create public expectation. Now in this paper I've only got time to focus on one emotionally charged word, which was frequently applied by contemporaries in their accounts. And this is the word wonder, or its adjectival form, wonderful. Indeed, the exhibition was often referred to as the great wonder of the world, or as the Lincolnshire Miller and poet Robert Franklin wrote, the Crystal Palace stands admired, extolled, a modern wonder of a wondering world. So I'm going to begin with a brief discussion of wonder, followed by an analysis of, it, of visitor responses to the building itself, and to the artifacts on display, and finally reflect on the contested nature of wonder. What significance should we attribute to the sense of wonder and the wonderful? In their book, Wonders and the Order of Nature, Lorraine Daston and Catherine Park noted that uh, in medieval and early modern period, uh, wondrous natural phenomena, such, such as monstrous births, as we have here, and shooting stars, were endowed with religious and political significance. Subsequently, the, the wonderful ceased to be a meaningful term as philosophers of the Enlightenment contemplated the universe with a superior, dispassionate sense of detachment. Apparent wonders, such as solar eclipses, could readily be shown to be nothing more than the outcome of the natural motions of the sun, the earth, and the moon. Yet despite the philosophers' of opposition to enthusiasm in all its forms, um, those less under the sway of Enlightenment philosophy continued to use the term nat natural wonder. And in the following examples from 1851, I'm going to show that the Great Exhibition invoked cries of wonder, both from the more philosoph philosophical and also from a, a wide range of other visitors. Now, the most impressive analysis of wonder appeared in Adam Smith's cha chapter, of wonder and the effects of novelty in his History of Astronomy, which was published in 1795 as part of his Essays on Philosophical Subjects. His theory 
uh, illuminates the actions to the 1851 exhibition, but also cuts across the dichotomy set up by Daston and Park. Smith argued that, that wonder is the emotion evoked when we are confronted by a novel experience. Inevitably, we rest content well, when we are able to refer a new observation to something which is existing, which it most clearly resembles. However, we are caught off balance when we encounter something for which we have not been prepared by our previous experience. When something quite new and singular is presented, he says, the imagination, the memory may fail to subsume this novel observation within the existing schema. And this uncertainty results in the emotional movement of the spirits, which constitute the sentiment probably called wonder. The emotional wonder is accompanied by that staring, that sometime rolling of eyes, you can try that, uh, that, suspicion, that suspension of breath, and the swelling of the heart, which we may all observe both in ourselves and in others when wondering at some new object. We need not pursue Smith's argument further, but instead apply it to the Great Exhibition. The sense of wonder evoked by the exhibition arose, I'm going to argue, because it far outstripped the previous experience of visitors. The first sight to greet the visitor uh, entering Hyde Park was, of course, Paxton's immense building, covering an area of nearly six times St Paul's Cathedral and incorporating 300,000 panes of glass. Its novelty arose not just from its size, but also its design. At the height uh, of, of the Gothic revival, Paxton had, had bro broken with tradition and instead used iron and glass and many innovative technologies. One visitor recorded her reaction and this was uh, Sarah Ellis, who um, uh, is writing in the Morning Call, that's a woman's monthly, which she conducted, and he, she expressed her admiration for the beautiful Crystal Palace, adding, the sight is perfectly inspiriting. People start, they clap their hands when they behold it. And the building, she added, looks on at the first view as if invisible spirits had built it. It strikes us first, with a thrill, a gush of feeling, and deep wonder. A more prosaic response came from this congregationist who described the Crystal Palace as light, airy, and graceful. It is sprung from the ground with more than usual mag magical celerity, and amidst the crowd of wonders, it is itself perhaps the thing that is most wonderful. And these are just two of the many responses which evoke a sense of wonder when they see the Crystal Palace. And it's important also to note that visitors often proclaim that, that normal language was inadequate to describe their experience. For example, a young Scottish artisan named John Todd wrote, the pen rebels and remonstrates on the folly of the attempt. Uh, floundering to find appropriate words, visitors often liken the experience to a dream or a fantastic scene from literature such as the description of the exotic palace in the popular novel A Thousand and One Arabian Nights. Uh, Macaulay recorded in his diary, I made my way into the, to, to the, the building, a most gorgeous sight, vast, grateful, beyond the dreams of the Arabian romances. The great exhibition far outstripped all previous exhibitions, and many of uh, for many visitors, it's also made exciting because this is their first visit to London and their first trip on, 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 on a steam railway. In many ways, the experience was one out of this world. And this heightened sense of wonder continued unabated as the, as the visitor travelled through the building examining outstanding artefacts. They were struck by the vast number of, ex of exhibits difficult to count, but well over a million individual items. And they're ranged from great slabs of coal to steam locomotives, and from a st statue of the Archangel Michael to a pair of native Canadian snowshoes. Visitors also rub shoulders with when, men and women of different social classes, um, and uh, people of many different races, and often wearing national costumes. 
Most visitors were overwhelmed by the novelty of the experience and reported their emotion or response. For example, a German visitor uh, reported that each encounter with a new display rekindled its enthusiasm, writing in the Expositor, a weekly specifically devoted to the exhibition, he noted that during the, his perambulations inside the Crystal Palace, he repeatedly asserted that this must surely be the most beautiful until I enter the next department and find articles as wonderful and as tasteful. Moreover, he, he, he noted that my wonder and reverence only increase uh, at each visit I pay to the exhibition. And other uh, visitors found th themselves make, making sim similar com comments. For example, the Quakeress Adelaide Derby, who visits on six occasions, uh, goes through various areas like jewellery, dressed in several china as we have here, and she she's, uh, notes, I think at every visit the place grew more wonderful and vast and beautiful. So like the German visit visitor, her sense of wonder was continually being stimulated by uh, further types of exhibit. Other, visit, other visitors found their sense of wonder aroused by specific items. Uh, for example, this uh, woman writing in um, the, the Illustrated London News, she does a whole series, uh, a lady's glance at the Great Exhibition, uh, talks about the shape of the artificial flowers uh, in, the di in their different forms and materials, which claim our wonder and admiration. Or how about going back, back to our friend John Todd from, from Scotland. He says not only was the Crystal Palace most beautiful and wonderful, but the machines in motion were the most stirring and wonderful uh, parts of the exhibition. There's one of them. The machines were twisting ropes, complicated and wonderful. The locomotives and carriages, really wonderful in every respect. I think he used the word wonderful 17 times in the report. <laughs> There were, however, occasional disappointments, most noticeably what's hidden under there, <laughs> the Cohen or Diamond. It had been much hyped in the press, owing to its fraught history, its associated with all sorts of catastrophes, and then in 1850 it had been taken or perhaps stolen uh, uh, from the Sikh rulers and presented to the Queen. It was also the most valuable thing uh, estimated to be worth two million pounds. And yet seen in its burglar-proof display, um, people were disappointed. One wrote, people came to wonder and there was really no wonder at all. <laughs> to the uninitiated eye, it certainly appeared nothing better than a piece of cut glass. Now, despite it not because of the repeated de declarations that the exhibition, and especially the Crystal Palace, evoked the visitor's sense of wonder, wonder became a contested term. And I want to just mention very briefly three types, three types of criticism that were mounted against uh, the, the exhibition. And all these critics pick up on the superficiality of this emotional response. Writing in the leader, it's about a newspaper of 12th of June 1851, George Jacob Holyoke, the rising star of political radicalism, noted that London was now awash with people enjoying the exhibition, and in a happy mood they pervaded the uh, metropolis. However, all this gaiety was, he claimed, an illusion, since Underneath the magic brilliance that dazzled the wandering beholder in that vast international museum, how few distinguish the grim misery that lies hidden there. Because behind all this wonder evoking exhibits lay a blanket of human misery, the artisan enfeebled and sick by unremitting toil in an unhealthy workplace his wife suffering in poverty without sufficient food to feed her children. And Holyoke incisively contrasted the visitor's superficial sense of wonder on seeing the beautiful objects on display in the Crystal Palace with the depressing social reality of human suffering required for the production of those very objects. 
Secondly, not dissimilar remarks were made by some of those who considered education to be the main um, aim of the exhi exhibition. Consider, to my example, the view of William Felkin, who was the mayor of Nottingham and a forceful advocate of the exhibition's value for both education and, and the expansion of trade. Felkin criticised those visitors who will only store the memory with ideas about isolated specimens, and who then fill their mind with wonder. And it may be affording pleasure in their recognition, but no more. He claimed that without making close comparison between exhibits, all this is a passing show. New technologies will only develop and trade will be increased if serious-minded visitors make a close and informed study of the exhibits. Otherwise, they would fail to meet the objectives and would instead degenerate into useless sh a vast show and the exhibition would just become another uh, bit of February. Wonder by itself, he's saying, is not productive of human progress. Thirdly, uh, as I've argued elsewhere in the Britain whole, whole book on this, uh, on the religious reactions to the exhibition, uh, these were extremely diverse. It provided some the the theologians with a vast canvas for natural theological reflection, and they urged their flock to understand the wonderful objects displayed in the Crystal Palace as the creations of God, who drew the handiwork of artisans. Thus a visit should be a profound religious experience. To quote a hymn of all nations by the conventional pious poet uh, Martin Tupper, in the wonders all around, ever is thy spirit found, and of each good thing we see, all the good is born in thee. However, other religious writers view the exhibition very differently. I'll give you one example. John Gifford Bellet, a leading member of the Plymouth Brethren, characterised the idolatrous attitudes of many visitors to the exhibition by citing chapter 13, verse 5 of the Book of Revelation. All the world wandered after the beast. Bellet portrayed these visitors as so engrossed in the man-made exhibits that they completely ignored God and his far more wonderful creation. He thus chastised the exhibition for its easy worldliness, the heartless way of man who can forget God's wonders. To see God in the jacquard bloom was for him sheer hubris. In conclusion, let me just summarise. For most visitors, the Great Exhibition evoked the emotion of wonder, because in so many respects, it far outstripped people's ex previous experience and conventional language. And yet, as Destin and Park rightly point out, uh, the uh, emotion of wonder is historically problematic. And it was rejected by many of its critics as being too superficial. Thus, in the last section, I discussed some of those who considered that mere wonder was a superficial reaction to the exhibition that masked appreciation of deeper political, educational, and religious realities. <laughs>